Love and Advertising by Richard Walton Tully I do not demand, said Mr. Pepper. I simply suggest a change. If you wish me to resign, his self-deprecating manner bespoke an impossible supposition. Very well, but if you see fit to find me a new assistant, he paused with an interrogatory cough. It was the senior partner who answered, We shall consider the matter. The advertising manager's lean face took on an expression of satisfaction. He bowed and disappeared through the door. Young Kaufman, the junior partner, smiled covertly. But the elder man's face bespoke keen disappointment, for it must be explained that Mr. Pepper's simple announcement bore vitally upon the only dissension that had ever visited the firm of Kaufman and Houghton during the thirty years of its existence. In 1875, when John Houghton, fresh from college, had come to visit New York to find his fortune, the elder Kaufman had been a candy manufacturer, with a modest trade on the east side. Young Houghton had taken the agency of a glucose firm. The disposal of its product had brought the two together, with the result that a partnership had been formed to carry on a wholesale confectionery business. Success in this venture had led to new and more profitable ends, the chewing gum trade. The rise to wealth of these two was the result of the careful plotting of the German workmen who kept the K and H products up to an invariable standard, joined with the other's energy and acumen in marketing the output. And this mutual relationship had been disturbed by but one difference. When Houghton was disposed to consider a college man for a vacancy, Kaufman, who had always been ready with his practical man that has worked his way, and every time in respect to his wishes houghton had given in reflecting that perhaps as kaufman said it had been that he himself was a good business man in spite of his college training not because of it and after all college ideals had sunk since his time and the college applicant had been sent away young jonathan kaufman graduated from grammar school houghton suggested high school and college. But, nine, said the elder Kaufman, I show him how better the gum to make. And he did. He put on an apron, as of yore, and started his son under his personal supervision in the washing room. He took off his apron when Jonathan knew all about handling chickle products, from import bag to tinfoil wrapper. Then he died and this year troublesome conditions had come on. The consolidated Pepsin people were cutting in severely. Houghton, now senior partner, had proposed, and young Kaufman agreed, that an advertising expert be secured. But the agreement ended there, for the first words of the junior partner showed Houghton that the spirit of the father was still sitting at the desk opposite, and smiling that same fat, phlegmatic smile at his supposed weakness for those college business. They had compromised upon Mr. Pepper, secured from Simpkins Practical Advertising School, but at the end of six months Pepper's so-called follow-up campaign had failed to meet materially the steady inroads of the Western men. He had explained that it was the result of his need for an assistant. It was determined to give him one. Then. One night, as he sat in his library, John Houghton had looked into a pair of blue eyes and promised to give Tom Brainerd the chance. In consequence, he had his hair tousled, been given a resounding kiss, and a crushing hug from the young lady on his knees. For Dorothy Houghton, despite her nineteen years, still claimed that privilege from her father. In that way, for the first time, a college man had come to be employed at K&H and been made an assistant to Mr. Pepper at the salary he demanded. Any old thing to start the ball rolling. And now had come the information that the senior partner's long-desired experiment had ended in failure. Young Kaufman turned to his work with the air of one who has given a child its own way and seen it come to grief. I... 
I suppose, said Hoffman slowly, we'll have to let Brainerd go. And then a peculiar thing happened. Through the open window, floating in the summer air, he seemed to see a familiar figure. It was dressed in fluffy white and carried a parasol over its shoulder. It fluttered calmly in, seated itself on the sill, and gazed at him with blue eyes that were serious, reproachful. Daddy, it said, and it brushed away a wisp of hair by its ear, just as another one long ago had used to. Daddy, it faltered, why did I ask you to give him a place if it wasn't because because the spell was broken by kaufman's voice whatever you do i am suited he was saying it might have been his father but if what pepper says about brainard the senior partner straightened up and pushed a button yes but we haven't heard what brainard said about pepper several moments later tom brainard entered medium-sized and muscled he was dressed in a loose-fitting suit that by its very cut told his training. He stood between them as Mr. Pepper had done, but there was nothing of the other's ingratiating diffidence in his level look. "'Sit down, Brainerd,' said Hooten. The newcomer did so, and the senior partner marked an attitude of laziness and indifference. Hooten became stern. "'Brainerd,' he began, I gave you a chance with us because, he paused, the other colored. I had hoped to make good without that. But this morning Mr. Pepper said we couldn't get along together. That's true. Ah, you admit it, said Kaufman. Yes. There was a pause. Then Hooten spoke. I can't tell you how much this disappoints me, Brainerd. The fact is, for years I have tried to shut my eyes to the development of college training. In my time, there was not the call for practicality that there is today. Yet it seems to me that the training in our colleges has grown less and less practical. Why do the colleges turn out men who spend their time in personal gossip over sport or trivialities? You remember that the King of Spain, or was it Cambodia, puzzled his wise men for a year as to why a fish, when dropped in a full pail of water, didn't make it overflow. What has that got to do with it? Because I must answer as the king did. It's not so. The pail does overflow. They hadn't thought to try it. You mean that I am wrong? Yes. Are you sure your gossips were college men? Ah! Hooten said with a gesture to his partner, who was about to speak. Then let us commence at the root of the matter. Mr. Kaufman and I have often discussed the subject. In this case, you are the one who has tried it. Suppose you explain our mistake. I'd be glad to do that, said Brainerd, because I've heard a lot of that talk. Well? Well, of course, when I say college man, I mean college graduate. Why? If a kitten crawls into an oven, is it a biscuit? There was an earnestness that robbed the question of any flippancy. Hooten laughed. No. If a dub does a college and gets flunked out in a month, is he a college man? Hardly. Oh, but he calls himself one. He goes to Podunk all decorated up with geraniums, and the rest of his life is a college man. I'm not talking about him or the man who comes to college to learn to mix cocktails inside. He may last to the junior year. I'm talking about the graduate. They're only about a tenth of the college, but they're the finished product. Mr. Kaufman, I wouldn't try to sell gum that had only gone as far as the rolling room, would you? What? Me? Would you? No. The junior partner was puzzled. That's because you wanted to go through all the processes. Well, let's talk about the boy who has gone all the way through the man factory. Hooten nodded. That's fair. The trouble is, people don't do that. They persist in butting into the college world, jerking out some sophomore celebration, and saying, What is this silly thing in the real world? Well, aren't they right? 
No, that's just the point. The college world is a mimic world, and your lifetime is just four years. A sophomore celebration is a practical thing there. Perhaps it's teaching loyalty. That generally comes first. That's your college rolling room. But the graduate, he'd learn to do something well. I never knew a college man who wasn't at least responsible. But, but here's the trouble. After selecting, say, 200 fellows out of an entering bunch of 600 and developing the thing each is best fitted for, father steps in and the boy who would make a first-class professor is put into business and blamed for being impractical. The fellow who has been handling thousands of dollars in college management and running twenty assistants, the man who could have taken the place, has no father to give him the boost necessary. And the other man's failure has cleared his chances. He has to go to work as a mere clerk under a man. Excuse me. I don't want to do any knocking. You think the whole trouble is caused by misdirected nepotism? Yes. Ah, said young Hoffman, but you say that you were trained in advertising on your college paper. Yes, and I was going to tell you today, if Mr. Pepper hadn't, that the money you're paying for me is utterly wasted. Ah, yes, I can't look in the face of a hungry designer and beat him down to within a dollar of the cost of materials. And and my suggestion on broader lines doesn't seem to cause much hurrah. Well, the junior partner set up, since you admit, he paused for his partner to speak the words of discharge, but Hooten was looking quizzically at the college man. What was your idea as to broader lines? Brainerd hesitated. Well, it seems to me that Pepper is trying to do two things that are antagonistic be elite, and sell chewing gum. The fact is that elite people don't chew gum. I'd like to know how the statement, Old Tulu, best by test, will make a kid on a corner with a cent in his fist have an attack of mouth-watering. Kaufman roused himself. It is true, our gum is the best. I'm not disputing that, but still, it's gum. If you're trying to increase the vulgar habit of gum chewing, well, you can't do it by advertising the firm's financial standing, its age, or the purity of its output. That would do for an insurance company or a bank. But gum? Who cares for purity? All they want to know is if it's schmecking gut. This last with a humorous glance at Kaufman. The latter was scowling. Brainerd was touching a tender spot. Well, what would you do? Brainerd flushed. He felt the tone of sarcasm in the elder man's voice. He tightened his lips. At least I'd change the name of the gum. Change the name? Goffman was horrified. Well, nobody wants old Tulu. They want new Tulu or fresh-tasting Tulu. At least something to appeal to the imagination of Sadie at the ribbon counter. Oh, observed Kaufman, and the name you suggest? Well, say something like Lulu Tulu. Gott, Kaufman struck the desk a blow with his fist. It was an insult to his father's memory. Brainerd rose. I'm sorry, he said, if I have offended. To save you any further bother, I'll just cut it out after Saturday. I thank you for the chance. He smiled a little ruefully. The chance you have given me. Good day, gentlemen. He turned on his heel and left the office. As John Houghton was driving home that night, he became suddenly conscious that he would soon meet the apparition of the afternoon in the flesh. And though, of course, there was no need, he found himself rehearsing the justification of his position. Lulu Tulu, indeed. Imagine the smile that would have illuminated the faces at the club on such an announcement. The impudence of the boy to have suggested it to him. Him, 
who had so often held forth upon the value of conservatism in business. And he remembered with pride the speaker, who had once said, It is such solid vertebrae as John Hooten that form the backbone of our business world. That speaker had been Bender, of the New York Dynamo Company. Poor Bender! The Western Electric Construction had got him after all. This line of thought caused Hooten to reach in his pocket and produce a letter. He went over the significant part again. Our Mr. Burns reports the clinching of the subway vending machine contract, it read, and this, together with our business, will give us over half of the New York trade. With this statement before us, we feel that we can make a winning fight if you still refuse to consider our terms. In view of recent developments, we cannot repeat our former offer, but if you will consider 67 as a figure, 67, and a year before he would not have taken 110. In the bitterness of the moment, he wondered if he, too, would finally go the way that Bender had. And then, as the butler swung the door back, he was recalled to the matter of Tom Brainerd, by the sight of a familiar figure that floated toward him as airily as it had its astral self that afternoon. He kissed her and went to his study. Just before dinner was not a time to discuss such things. But later, as he looked across the candelabra at his daughter, all smiles and happiness in that seat that had been her mother's, he regretted that he had not, for, Daddy, Dorothy was saying, I've got such a funny note from Tom this afternoon. He said there had been a change at the office, and that you will explain. Yes. Well, she paused eagerly, it's something awfully good, I know. Her father frowned and caught her eye. Later, he said significantly. The girl read the tone, and the gaiety of the moment before was gone. After that, they ate in silence. One cigar, two cigars had been smoked when she stole into the library. Since coffee, whether from design or chance he never knew, she had rearranged her hair. Now it was low on her neck in the fashion of long ago, with a single curl that strayed over the white shoulder to her bosom. She knelt at his side without a word. He looked down at her. Somehow he had never seen her like this before, that curious womanly expression. "'Tell me,' was all she said. And, as he told Tom Brainerd's failure to fit in, he watched her closely. I'm sorry, he concluded. So am I, Daddy, she returned steadily, because I'm going to marry him. What? Oh, you knew you must have, she said, when I ask you to give him the chance. The father was silent. In fancy he again heard Dorothy Warner promising, against her parents' advice, to wait for her John to get on in the world. Well, he said, do you think you've given him a fair chance? He was restored to his usual poise. I suppose he'd complain that I didn't. Dorothy's eyes went wild. No, he said that after I had heard the news from you, he would leave everything to me. Oh, but, father, I don't think you've been fair. Tom is right. I don't chew gum, do I? Well, he said indignantly, then he stopped thoughtfully. No, but Mary downstairs does. She wouldn't be offended by Lulu Tulu. I dare say she think it was just grand. He returned no answer. Come, Daddy, she went on. New York has grown lots ever since I was little. And, and some people get behind the times. They think they're being dignified when it's only that they're antiquated. He looked shrewdly at her. I've never heard you talk like that before. Where did you? Tom said that a week ago, she admitted. And he said, too, that he could double the results if he only had full swing. Instead, you admit he's a mere clerk to that horrid pepper. Oh, Daddy, Daddy, she pleaded. 
Give him a chance. Then her voice went low again. I'm going to marry him anyway, she said, and you don't want this between. If he fails, I'll stand the loss from what mother left me. Give him full swing. A real chance, Daddy. He's going to be your son. John Hooten looked into the earnest girlish face. He wound the curl around his finger. Kaufman has always wanted to visit the fatherland, he said irrelevantly. She gave a quick, eager look. And that Pepper could go on vacation. Days dragged very slowly at a summer resort, especially when one has promised not to write to him. But Dorothy's father had kept his word, so she could but do the same. Besides, in the sweltering city, in full charge for six weeks, was Tom Brainerd. His authority included permission to invent and use any new labels or trademarks he saw fit. The girl at the seashore, however, was also busy, amusing her father that he might not give too much time to thinking. And then, when three of the six weeks had passed, came the accident to the motor car. She was told that, with rest and no worries, her father would recover in a week or two. She cheerfully fitted into the role of assistant to the nurse in charge, and, as soon as the doctor allowed, prepared to read his mail to him, as he lay, eyes and head bandaged. But as she opened and glanced over the accumulated letters, she suddenly went pale. She read one in particular from end to end, and then, with a scared, furtive look at the bandaged figure, slipped it into a pocket. Later, when her father had finished dictating to her, she answered the concealed letter herself. Again the days drifted. The bandages were removed, but still the girl continued to scan the mail. Her vigilance was rewarded. She flushed over a second letter which, with one in a worn envelope, she took to her father. He saw the careworn expression. My little girl has been overworked, he said. She held out the worn letter. I had this for some time, but, but... I waited for something more, and here it is. She showed the other. He took the first, and when he had finished, his hand was trembling. I regret to report that things are in chaos, it ran. All of the regular advertising has been withdrawn. The usual entertainment money for salesmen, classed under this head, has been stopped. In consequence, our city trade has tumbled fearfully, and you know how bad it was before. The worst news I have to offer is in regard to Mr. Brainerd personally. Our detective reports that his time outside is spent in the most questionable company. He has been seen drinking at roof gardens with a certain dissipated pugilist named Little Sullivan, and was traced with this man to the apartment of a song-and-dance woman named Violetta. He seems to be spending money extravagantly, and visits certain bohemian quarters in the vicinity of Jones Street, where he puts in his time with disreputable-looking men. I beg leave to advise immediate action. Mowbray. My God, groaned Houghton. This explained that derisive offer of fifty-one from Consolidated Pepsin. And you kept this from me? They said not to worry you, she said. I, I've had enough for two. Besides, I answered it. You did? What? I told them to wait a little longer. The father groaned again. I just had to, Daddy. And then today this letter came. He seized it eagerly. It read, You were right about waiting. Suspend all action. What does it mean? she asked. We'll find out tomorrow, he answered grimly. The 4.30 train gave John Hooten just time to reach the office before it closed. Dorothy went home. Her father, roused by the evil news of the day before, had impressed her with all that it might mean in a material way. As though that mattered. As though anything could hurt her more. She would have been willing to go with Tom Brainerd in rags before. But now... 
She sat by the telephone with clenched fists, her traveling veil still pushed up on her hat. The lines that had come into her face during the past week deepened with the dusk. At last, a long, sharp ring. Yes, father. Not dine at home. Meet you at Yolen. A guess. Yes, but about Tom. What? 7.30. But about Tom, Dad. Goodbye. But Daddy. It was no use. He had hung up. She called feverishly for the office, but the reply was, they do not answer. Mechanically, she went up to her room. The blue mousselet, Susan, she said. As the maid laid it out, she walked the floor. Through the window, the park lay green and inviting. She longed to fly to the cool grass and run and run. From below came the loud, rasping notes of a street piano that, in some incomprehensible fashion, had wandered to the deserted row of houses. The noise, for all that there was a pleasing swing in the air, irritated her. She threw the man a quarter. Go away, she waved. At last the maid said her mistress was ready, and Dorothy, without questioning the decision, allowed herself to be put into the brougham. The drive seemed hours long. Then her father's face told her nothing. Without a word, he led her to the reception room. As they entered, a figure sprang to meet them. For a moment she hesitated. Then, Tom, she cried, and caught his hand. He saw the whiteness of her face, and all the yearnings of their separation matched it upon his. Dorothy, he faltered. Her father interrupted. Tom is to explain how he has quadrupled our business in the last week. A sudden weakness seized her. She followed them unsteadily. Seated at the table, however, she was able to smile again. At that moment the orchestra struck up and suddenly caught her attention. Tum to tum, tum to tum, tum that haunting, swinging melody of the street piano. What tune is that? she asked. Brainerd smiled. That is a tune that has suddenly become popular. Any night you might see hundreds of East Side children dancing on the asphalt and singing it. Yes, she said. I heard it on a street piano. It's called, he went on, My Lulu Tulu Girl. All the grinders have it. Bill Tompkins, Naughty Three, who lives in the Jones Street social development, worked that for me. Those dagos worship him. Saved a kid's life or something. A light came into John Houghton's eyes. That's part of the scheme. Aspwell wrote the song. I found him down in Bohemia working on an opera. But for the sake of the old days, in the senior extravaganza, he turned off my Lulu Tulu girl. You know those orders on your desk for our new brand, Lulu Tulu? The song was introduced two weeks ago at the Metropolitan Roof by Violetta, a young lady who married our old football trainer, Little Sullivan. We'll hear her later. I have tickets. Then we'll go to Lace. There's a turn there by Jim Bailey and his six Lulu Tulu girls. Rather vulgar. While they dance, they chew gum and perform calisthenics with it. But it seems to go. Then, Tom, after we've dined, I'll show you our regular magazine and newspaper advertising in the reading room. Double space. You see, I couldn't ask you to increase, so I stopped it for a time and saved it up. But I hope you'll stand for it regularly. It's mainly pictures of Miss Lulu Tulu in a large fedora hat with a verse below apostrophizing the poetry of motion of her jaws. Then there's a line of limericks about the adventures of the Lulu Tulu gummies, small gum-headed tykes, always in trouble until they find Lulu. I got Phillips to do that as a personal favor. Also, note you something, I suppose, remarked Houghton. Yes, but he graduated before my time. I knew his work from the college annual. He's in the magazines now. 
Then I got Professor Wheaton. Jimmy the Grind, we used to call him. His folks wanted him to be a poet. Imagine Jimmy a poet. I got Professor Wheaton to give us some readers on Tulu as a salivary stimulant. The healthful effect of pure saliva on food production and the degenerative effect of artificially relieving an organ of its proper functions that hit the pepsin people you see and so it ran until he had covered his plan fully and dorothy's face with happy smiles tom said the father if i had opened that letter instead of dolly dorothy suddenly became demure under their gaze and sought to change the subject then you admit, Daddy, that a college man is of some use. I'll admit that Tom got the business, but that was because he is naturally clever and businesslike. Not because... Just a moment, said Brainerd. I think I can show that you're mistaken. I found out that Pepper was doing the wrong thing. By the first rule of criticism, freshman English. What is the author trying to do? Does he do it? Is it worth doing? Substitute advertising man for author, and you have a business that is worth doing, since you continue it. And by the other two questions, I saw his incongruity of subject matter and expression. My economics taught me the law of supply and demand. Analytical research of original authorities taught me where the demand was. There was only the problem of a cause to stimulate it. Through deductive logic and psychology, I got the cause that would appeal, and the effect worked out in an increased demand, which we were ready to supply, just like a problem in math. The elder man smiled. I don't understand a word you said, but it seems to have worked well. In the future, Bring in as many of your naughty friends as we need. I'll answer for Kaufman. The other shook his head. I'm not sure they would be any too anxious. Houghton gasped in surprise. What's that? They would not be anxious to go into business? Why not? Why not? There was equal amazement in the young man's tone. Would you be anxious to leave a place where you are surrounded by friends you've tried? Friends that won't stab you in the back the next minute and call it a business deal? Where you're respected and in control of things, and plunge out to become a freshman in the world life? To do the sorting and trying all over again? I remember, I remember. And besides, what right has anyone to assume that business is above art? charity or even mere learning billy tompkins in the slums helping dagos is a failure to his father so is aspwell with his opera so is williams with his spectacles in his lab but who knows when the great business is finally balanced he stopped conscious that he was growing too rhetorical if you love college ideals so much more than business observed Houghton, then why did you come to us? A different light stole into the young man's eyes. Because, he answered, because I love something else better than either. And he reached his hand under the cloth to one who understood. That is all, except that the next offer from Consolidated Pepsin was, Will you please name your own terms? 